Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 8. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter, for the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is, a, this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a labourer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. For he will not remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions and honour so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity, it is a grievous evil. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes in vanity and goes in darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to one place? All the toil of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool? And what does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity, and what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? So today we'll be reading, um, moving on to Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 34. So I'll give you some time to flip over your Bible to Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 34. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamb of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. 
If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither saw nor rip nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we uh, wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Well, if you can have that outlined open in front of you to follow along the talk, and let's ask God to help us to understand his word in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 onwards. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that we might be those who seek your kingdom first. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Think about the uh, next 10 years. That's too far. Maybe just the next five years. What are your worries? What do you fear? Not to have a good job. Not to be as successful as your cousins or your brothers. Not to be able to get your permanent residency. Not to be able to buy your own property. Or not in a nice enough suburb. Not to be able to afford a nice holiday. A nice car. Not to get married. Or you worry about your kids struggling. That you cannot give them the opportunities that your parents gave you. Thickness. These are common anxieties about life, and even when we're not a particularly anxious person, we worry about those things. Because there's so much expectations that's placed upon us. And sometimes we place these expectations on ourselves. We compare ourselves with the people around us. We fear to miss out. But have you really asked yourself deep down why we have these fears? Is it because we're just pessimistic? You know, whatever can go wrong, will go wrong? Is it because we want to control things? Is it because we just need to prove ourselves to make ourselves feel valuable? Or is it deep down we want to be secure? To feel secure? Or is it something else? And what's the solution? Is money the solution? If I can make enough money or my parents can send me enough money, then surely if I throw enough money at something, it'll solve everything, wouldn't it? Or it does to a large extent. Money's the power to get things done. That's why we want a good career, good job, so that we can make enough money to have life's little luxuries, life's big luxuries, to be envied by others. We want that little buffer in the bank account, protection, uh, to set up the next generation. I mean, you've got to admit it, that money does give quite a bit of security. It does solve many anxieties, doesn't it? And so, all the things that we long for, success, the symbols that we get from it, style of living, 
living in style, the significance, the security. Money is the answer, is it not? You know, when someone challenges you and says, why not do full-time Christian ministry? Why not be a missionary somewhere? It's very hard when the non-Christian relative says, okay, well, if you do that, is your God going to put food on the table? If you're not living in Australia, is your God going to pay the medical bills? It's very hard, isn't it, to answer those questions. But they've got a good point, don't they? But it's, is money a foolproof solution? How come those who are very rich still worry? Jesus, point two, speaks to his followers. Uh, the crowds are listening on. And Jesus shakes our confidence in money. And he points us to how we can actually get real security from anxiety. He lays the foundation on the real treasure that we can have in chapter 6, verse 19 to 24. And then in the next section, verse 25 to the end of the chapter, he spells out the implications of this real foundation for solving our life's anxieties. Pick it up from chapter 6 and verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. Notice there's a contrast here. But it's a contrast of all exactly the same things. Now those phrases are just paralleled from one to the other. The only difference with the treasures in heaven is the negative. What you're going to lose in the treasures of this earth, you're not going to lose in the treasures of heaven. The contrast between the impermanence of the earthly treasure, it's transient. It doesn't last. Not even in this life. Moth and rust destroy. Versus the permanence of heavenly treasure, where neither moth nor rust destroy. In our family, over the years, we've had problems with moths. Uh, clothes moths that go and eat holes into your jumpers. But also we've had what we call pantry moths, food moths. If you ever see anything like that, be aware. It wasn't just in our kitchen, it was in our garage. Because we've got two shelves in the garage where we put our extra food, you know, the cereals, the pasta, the, the bread, etc. And then one summer all these moths came out. It was a big problem. It got all around the plastic, all around the jars. And so uh, my wife, Karen, said, well, just, just you know, get rid of it all. You know, we don't want it infesting the whole place. And so um, I started throwing things out. Every now and then I'd go to my wife and say, what about this? You know, I said, oh, just, just chuck it. And she had a headache, so just throw it, you know in the little box, there could be a little one still left there, you know, and they'll multiply, so just, just throw it out. So I just cleared it, binned it, chucked it. A week later, on a Friday evening after Bible study, I came home, we're talking about something in the garage, and suddenly my wife goes, oh, you didn't throw out the diamond ring, did you? What diamond ring? Well, she had mentioned it before once to me. It was a diamond ring that her father had inherited from the um, aunties and uncles in Europe. Uh, they, they were Jewish people uh, that had gone through uh, the Second World War in concentration camps, etc. And so when you go through that, what you do is you, you keep something that's very liquid, right? That you can easily, you know, in a time of emergency in war, you can just sell the diamond and, and run away and take a train or take a plane. And he had hidden this diamond ring in his backyard, wrapped in tissue and in a jar, coffee jar, for many, many years. Until just recently, he started to trust us and say, okay, Karen, you can now have it, it's yours. Put it away safely. 
So my wife put it away safely in the garage with all the other food stuff. No label on it because we don't want thieves coming in and say, oh, diamond, and take it. <laughs> and so I had just binned and thrown out this jar with this diamond ring. Well, what really? So we go in the garage that night. We go to the red bin and go through it. Oh, no, you know, the, the, gar the, 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 the garbage truck has been already. How about the yellow bin? They didn't cut, cut, get that yet. So go through all the yellow bin. Did I just chuck the jar in the yellow? No, that's all gone. And, and, and on Monday, I tried to ring up the council, and the council says, look, no chance, no chance. When my son came home that night, uh, we told him, and he just laughed and said, ah, moth and rust. But it really wasn't that funny because the ring was last valued at about $40,000. Uh, we never had the guts uh, to tell uh, my father-in-law about this. I had worked out what to say to him. If he ever asked, I was going to say, don't worry, it's in a very safe place that no one can find. <laughs> Safety, money, something for a rainy day, is it really going to last? Your parents help you to buy a flat. In mascot, real estate, no permanent, real. And then it turns out to be the mascot towers where they have concrete cancer and problems and was, wasn't built properly and no one's going to pay out the insurance and you're left with this flat that no one with any sense is going to want to buy. Inflation eats up at our money. Our shares go up and then they go down. Even if you're an oligarch and you own a football franchise, you can have all that just taken away from you, can you not? Remember what Ecclesiastes said? There's a grievous evil that I've seen under the sun. Riches were kept by the owner to his herd, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. He's a father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. He came from his mother's room, and he shall go again. Naked as he came, he shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry in his hand. Even in this life, everything we have has a use-by date, like the rotten milk in the fridge. And how much more when we die? We cannot take anything with us. And even if we have something to give to the next generation, then how do you know, Ecclesiastes says, whether the person you give it to is going to be wise or a complete fool? You've spent all your life as a migrant, worked hard, got your job, got your company going, got your good degree, and you give everything to your kids, and they don't appreciate it. They just spend all day watching Netflix. Not permanent. Contrasts the kingdom of heaven. That is permanent. It is the kingdom which has a great reward. Remember the Beatitudes? Now, blessed are you because yours is the kingdom of heaven in chapter 5. You have comfort. You have inheritance. You will be the sons of God. You have mercy. You have, you'll be able to actually see God. All those things are permanent. All well, us, remember the Lord's Prayer. We pray, your kingdom come. We pray, God, please give us your will now. May your plans happen. May we live in your kingdom. May we have the bread of heaven, the Sabbath bread, heaven itself. May we be forgiven. May, may we be rescued from the evil one. All those things are permanent. Relationship with God as his privileged people. Jesus has brought and Jesus will bring again finally at the second coming. All that is permanent. Things that you don't have to rely on mothballs or anti-rusts or burglar alarms. The kingdom of heaven is eternal. But 
to see that requires a radical change in just how we how we view everything, our perspective on life. In the light of this kingdom of heaven drawing near, Jesus says, make sure you see things clearly. Matthew chapter 6 here, look in your Bible, verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of life. But if your eye is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, Jesus is just speaking on uh, layman's terms, right? He's not really talking about the anatomy of the eye that you medical doctors know or optometrists know. Um, it's a bit like, let me try an experiment on you. Okay, everyone, ready? Everyone, just close your eyes, both eyes. Right? Just close your eyes. Ready, everyone, close both eyes. It's a bit dark, isn't it? I know there's the bright lights around, but it's a bit dark, isn't it? Now, open your eyes. Ah, oh, suddenly there's light. That's what the first pen century people understood, right? Your eye is how the light comes into your body. Great experiment, isn't it? I should have done a PhD in optometry or something like that. <laughs> if your eyes are not good, well, the whole body is full of darkness. That is, if your view of what is truly treasure is not good, then your whole life is going to go wrong. Your whole life is going to be darkness, ultimately, in the end. Here's another experiment. I can, without doing a thorough survey, look out there and see all of you and work out which of you, especially Asians, are wearing contact lenses. I know that. It's all of you who are not wearing glasses. As of those wearing contact lenses? Come on. Oh. You see, basically, especially as Asians, we are all short-sighted. It's inherited from our parents, or it's because we studied too much, too many books, and too much looking at the screen. Uh, my wife, Karen, is an optometrist, and she tells us that, you know, every hour you spend looking at the screen, if you have a few minutes, it's looking into a distance, right? Relax. These are very practical talks, aren't they? Uh, see some free optometry advice as well. But look into the distance. Don't just be blinded by what you see right in front of you. Jesus says, if your eyes are bad, then... You need to get new vision. Do you remember when you first went to the optometrist when you were a little kid and you were short-sighted? And suddenly you go, wow, I didn't know there are little dots in that, uh, that board. I didn't know there are lines in, in the bricks. Oh, I can see afar. You know, some of you are driving. Oh, there are the traffic lights. I didn't see them before. Now everything becomes clear. Long-sightedness. What's that called? Those of you who are doctors, medical students, what's long sightedness called? Come on. Yes, hyper, oh, very good. Thank you, Joseph. Hyperopia. At least there's one medical student that should pass. Hyperopia. Short sightedness is called myopia. I always couldn't work out which was which, I always got it confused. Until I worked out, the way to remember is, I am short-sighted. That's myopia. Friends, we are all short-sighted. We just think that what is valuable is just what we can see in this world. We live for the now. That's what we chase for. I don't know if you've ever been up in a tall building, you look down, you know, 30 stories down, and you see the little people walking around and the cars driving around, and you just look at it and think, what are all these people doing? I remember when I first uh, sort of went back to Hong Kong as an as a, you know, adult, and I, I was amazed, so many people, and all the buildings, you know, and all these people living in little boxes, a bit like that in Singapore and Shanghai, I guess, as well, in Jakarta, and... I think, what are they all doing? What are they all living for? 
That's the same in Australia, except we're living in bigger houses. What are we living for? We need the lenses of the kingdom of heaven. We need what I call Matthew 6.6 6 vision to see the real perspective. But it's a radical change, isn't it? And it's a radical change that says in chapter 6, verse 24, you actually cannot have both. You cannot have two masters. You either hate one and love the other, or you're devoted to one, devoted to one, and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. It's really just uh, taken from the experience of, uh, of life in first century and masters and slaves. You, you can only serve one master. Even in the modern day, it's, you know, those of you who've tried to work for two bosses, it gets very hard, doesn't it? Well, how much more if someone is your master? Sooner or later, you're going to come into some conflict. Which one are you going to do the work for now? You've got to make a choice. When push comes to shove, you've got to actually decide for one or the other. It's like you know, the old illustration, if you've got a foot standing on the wharf and you've got a foot standing on the little rowboat and the little rowboat is going out into the water, you've got to make a choice, isn't it? You've got to decide to stand on one or the other. Well, is it God or is it? the treasures of this world. You cannot serve both. Now, it's not that money itself is evil, but it is evil to serve money as master. It's evil to actually listen and obey money. You cannot do both. Either obey the God who made the world or obey the money, which is part of God's creation. Which do you think actually is worth it? Friends, over time, over the next five, ten years, you can tell usually where we've actually chosen. Very rarely is it an explicit one decision. You know, I make this unethical, dishonest, you know, go to jail kind of decision in my work, and I love money, and so I decide to be dishonest. Very rarely do we do things like that. More likely, we make lots of little decisions, multiple decisions, to say yes to the extra demand of the boss, to begin to sell our soul to the company, another overtime, another rung of the ladder we want to climb on. And so no more time for really anything else, for family, for church family, for anything. We grow up thinking we can have it all, don't we? We can have my, my work and my career and, and be Christian as well. But actually, if we actually call our work career, it's almost halfway there to selling our soul to money. For in the Bible, work is just a job. The whole idea of career is that we actually become someone. It's more than a job. I am my job. And we have the symbols of success that we can show everyone. We have a trajectory, a path. We want to go somewhere. It's our passion. It's our heart. Sometimes we, we cover it up and we think we, maybe we can have both. You know, I can glorify God by being really successful in my job. But look at what Paul says in, in Titus. So servants, submit to your masters. World pleasing, don't argue uh, Don't be argumentative. Don't steal, don't pilfer. Show good faith so that in everything you may adorn the doctrine of God, our Saviour. See, how do you give glory to God? How do you get people to say, oh, it's, look, that's, that guy's a, a Christian. Wow, I want to be like that. It's not because you are the lawyer, the doctor, the best engineer, the best in your field. Look, even the servant, even the lowest of the low, can give glory to God. And they give glory to God by the godliness, not pilfering, being of good faith. That is how you give glory to God, not by the status of your work. 
job is just a job. And if you do your job, well, what kind of job do you need? How much money do you actually need to earn? Well, again, the Apostle Paul speaks of covetousness, greed, as idolatry. What's an idol? An idol is something you trust in the place of God. And therefore you serve it because you really want that security. We keep up with the Joneses or the Wongs. We think that the person who earns the most money when he dies actually wins. But Jesus says there in chapter 6 and verse 21, where your treasure is, verse 21, where your treasure is, there is your heart also. What you think, your effort, your energy, your hopes. Money is a good servant, but a really terrible master. A career, you know, a career, you know what a career is? Career is not a noun, career is a verb. You know, when you're driving down the mountain, you know, from the Cameron Highlands in um, Malaysia and driving down the road, when you're going too fast and you lost control of your car, then your car careers off the road and smashes. That's what a career is. You chase it and it will bring ultimate destruction to your faith. I've seen many of my friends after university, five, ten years later, they just gradually drift away. They called themselves Christian once, but in the end, they did not listen to Jesus. So point three is the real treasure we could actually know about. He's the real treasure that doesn't go to pass, that's not eaten by moths, like the treasure on earth. Have the right, right view. Do not be short-sighted or myopic. And know that you actually cannot serve God and money. See, once you've got verse 9 into 24, once you've got your loyalty there, and that's your heart, that's your allegiance, that's who you trust, God, once we see that trusting and living for God's kingdom is the treasure that lasts, then that's the foundation on which to build the fortress against anxiety. And so point three then, there's no need to be anxious. You see the transition there between verse 24 and 25? Verse 25 starts off with that word, therefore, as because of what we've just Look that. Therefore, do not be anxious. Do not be anxious about your life. Do not be anxious about your body. What are the things that people can be anxious about their life? Well, it's what you eat, what you drink. About your body, or well, it's what you put on. Do not be anxious. Now, that's come throughout the passage. Have a look in your Bible. In verse 31, again, same verse, isn't it? Cut and paste. Jesus says, therefore, do not be anxious, verse 31, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Or verse 34, do not be anxious about tomorrow. It is more than just the carefree attitude of hakuna matata. It's a lot more than that. The me cat and the war hog was just trying to tell Simba, ah, oh, just enjoy life, you know, take it easy when there's really no good reason to be taking it easy. You know, living for God's kingdom, that that is the treasure that lasts, that actually gives us a foundation. That is the reason. And then flows these extra very good reasons of why we're not to be anxious. Verse 25. Is not life more than food? and the body more than clothing. Now, it's not saying that we should be like a monk, right? Uh, be ascetic, be monastic, as though, you know, uh, physical things, as though physical things are, are evil or anything. 
No, no. It assumes we need food. It assumes we need clothing. But it's just to say, hey, there's a lot more to life than that. A lot more to your body than what you, the clothes that you put on. Don't shortchange yourself by just going after what you eat and drink and wear. It's silly, isn't it? Do you think that life is about what you eat and drink? Nothing wrong with bubble tea. But if you think bubble tea is what life is about, it's not just bubble tea. You know, some people have the fine dining in restaurants. What you eat, what you wear, the designer clothing. See, that's what the world runs after. And yet we can be tempted by every one of them. It's pleasurable, isn't it? It's nice to have those holidays, not, not wrong. But to have that luxury, what's it going to cost you? Nothing wrong with having hobbies. I may have hobbies over time, like making little rattle control cars, right? I have a Batman car that I make little, you know, make it control. It's, it's good fun. And then I looked on YouTube one day and I saw someone in America, and Americans do these things, where he actually built a real Batmobile, right? You know, and he drives and it's just like the one in the movies. And I got so excited, I showed my wife, look at this. And she said, what a waste of a life. <laughs> Your hobby is your hobby, but if your whole life is revolving around it, you come to your midlife crisis when you've achieved all those things, so what? Life is more than the senses. And point B, it, life is, in fact, you are more valuable than the creation of God. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor weep nor gather into barns, and yet a heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than day? Notice it's not Mother to Nature that supplies the food for the birds. It's God who looks after them. You don't see birds going to uni and graduating, do you? Uh, unless, you know, you like Snoopy and Woodstock. No, the birds are just there and they live. God gives them food. Or verse 28 to 31. Are you anxious about clothing? Well, look at the flowers, the leaves of the field. They don't go to uni. They don't toil. They, and yet they are more beautiful than even Solomon. God gives all the beautiful flowers of the field more beautiful than any dress you can have. See, your body is far more than clothing. You are far more valuable. God cares for you. If he looks after those things, the flowers, it's, either they gone tomorrow, you at least will last you know, maybe 70 years. God will look after us, especially we, his children. And so Jesus challenges them, you of little faith, in verse 27, which of you, by being uh, anxious, will actually add a, a single hour to your lifespan? You could argue the opposite, actually, that the more worried and stressed and anxious you are, you actually shorten your lifespan. Have your eyes clear so you see eternity. I've been speaking to a, a Christian couple recently, and the wife has terminal cancer. And the other day, they, they said to me, look, it's okay. We've made our peace with God. Christian people who worked out that this life is not the end. In fact, you cannot add an hour to your life. The psalmist says, God has ordained your very days. Be sure your body before it was formed. Your days are all ordained. All your days are ordained before one of them came to be. 
Our life actually is in God's hands. And in verse 34, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow be anxious of itself. Sufficient is for the day is its own trouble. I learned from the same Christian couple, that you just take a step at a time. This is not saying that uh, you don't plan at all. Uh, James chapter 4, he says, look, nothing wrong with planning, but if you plan as though you can control life, hey, tomorrow, today, we'll go and do such and such. Spend it there, make lots of money. Verse 14, how do you know what even tomorrow will bring? You could, you could, you know, there's, there's the, um, the Taiwanese lady who was graduated from this uni and was just walking up from lower campus up to the, um, the main office, you know, to get her degree. And on her way up, while they were building Scientia, a big truck, the handbrake came off and it rolled backwards and killed her. There's a little uh, red wall, right, just below Scientia, um, Below the quad, I think below the quad, no, below, between the CLB and the quad, right? It's a red wall there, and you can go and look, there's a little plaque there. She thought she got everything, the whole world in front of her, and did not know that she would not make it to the top of the campus. But we can't know. And so don't worry about, you know, oh, which school is my children going to go to? I don't even have children yet. I'm not even married yet, all right? Uh, we can worry about so many things. Make plans, but know that God is the one who actually will plan out your life. And so point three then, no need to be anxious for the treasures on earth. There's more to life than these things. You are more valuable than the bird's you won't add any more days to your life. And more than enough is each day's worry. God, your heavenly father, he's actually got it in his hands. So let's face it, all the anxieties we go through is basically about storing earthly treasure. We've got to remember that for Jesus in the first century, when he's talking to the disciples, when he says, you know, don't worry about what you eat, what you drink, what you wear, he's talking about just basic physical needs, basic necessities, daily necessities. And a few chapters later, he tells 12 of his disciples, you know, go, go to the mission and don't, just, just wear one shirt. Don't even take a, a money bag with you. See, he's, he's operating on that, this, you know, get through to the next day level. When we think, oh, what shall we wear? What shall we eat? We think, oh, which kind of 50 bubble tea should I have? Which restaurant should I go to in Kingsford or Strathfield or, you know? But we are worried about at a lot higher level of standard of living. Except we don't want the standard, do we? We always want the upsize, you know, the large, the supersize. We don't want the standard version. We want the um, luxury model. It's so easy to compare ourselves with our peers when really we've got so much already. God has provided for our needs. I've watched Master Chef. I've watched this uh, architecture show called Grand Design. Yeah, very interesting. But have you ever thought what the people in our world who are starving thinks about MasterChef? Have you ever thought what people just want a roof, you know, a tin roof above their head? What they think of grand design, where all people are about is you know, build their dream home for the next two years and they worry about whether their money will get there, whether there's too much weather and whether the beam will hold and whether the beautiful design will. They're just caring about things of this life, as is all advertising. 
For them, life is just about the now. You can see what is their treasure, because that's where their heart is. And so the climax of this whole section is verse 33, a very famous verse. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you as well. See there in your Bible, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, for when his kingdom comes, his justice will be done. And all these things shall be added to you. Remember, the whole Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5 to 7 has been really about Matthew chapter 4, verse 7 repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I've tried to argue that that is the real change we need to have. That's what repentance is about, that 180 degree turn. And yet, it's a repentance, it's an active thing we do, not just because we want to be good, it's not good works that earns our way to heaven, but it's a real repentance and a response we make because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so I talked to you Spanish, right? Real is a real, Real Madrid. It's the, it's the regal, kingly, the one who wins. God's kingdom has come. And so, repent. That's exactly the same, isn't it? As seek first the kingdom of God. Seek his rule. It's breaking in. Jesus coming and preaching. Jesus healing. Jesus doing miracles. Jesus forgiving the, the prostitute. Jesus dying on the cross and rising again, we are to repent and turn under his kingship. To turn from self-government to Jesus' government. It's about relating to him. From seeking my kingdom first to seeking his kingdom first. Remember? Jesus, the one who says, you've heard that it was said long ago. The elders, the Pharisees, the tradition, they said this, but I say unto you. Here again, have a look there in verse 25 in your Bible, chapter 6, verse 25, therefore I tell you. Here's Jesus' authoritative word, his kingly word again, do not lay up treasures on earth, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. See, to repent, to seek first the kingdom of God, is to lay up treasures in heaven. And remember what those treasures are? The beatitude blessings. Remember those? To be comforted, to inherit the land, to have the righteousness that God will bring by his justice to be satisfied with that, to have God's mercy, to actually see God, to actually be the sons of God. And it's the same as what we ask for in the Lord's Prayer, that his kingdom will come, that his will be done. We have the bread of heaven that will be forgiven, that will be taken from the powers of Satan. That is the kingdom that is eternal. That's worth repenting. That's worth turning to. See, it's the kingdom of mercy and forgiveness that Jesus has brought in. That is the real treasure. That is the real treasure. But it should change ourselves. You see, to be anxious about what we eat, what we drink, what we wear. You see in verse 31 and 32 of Matthew 6, that's just what the Gentiles, what the pagans, what the non-Christian world seeks after. 
in our modern Christian world, we have these things called influencers, don't we? You know, on Instagram or YouTube or whatever, TikTok. Uh, you know, millions of people follow these people, follow their fashion, follow what they buy, follow their business ideas. But it's all about what you eat, what you drink, what you wear. We are to be different. The kingdom has arrived. The kingdom of God is what should actually, Jesus is what should actually influence us. And not an influencer who, you know, just over this part of life or that part of life, but influence over all our life. And not an influencer who we can just take the advice from and or we can just leave it. No, Jesus demands that he be king. What does it look like? One of our friends who was in focus a little while ago, he did the most cool PhD I've ever heard. He was in aeronautical engineering and he did his PhD on F1 airfoils. All the guys are going, whoa, cool. All the girls are going, what's F1? <laughs> Drive to survive, right? Watch that. Uh, I went to his room once and he not only had model cars of, you know, Formula One racing cars, big ones, small ones. He had books on them. And it's not the sort of coffee table kind of books. He had all these books of all the stats and all the details and everything, the engine size. And that was his life growing up. And now he could actually do this for his PhD. And at the end of his PhD, he could have been invited by Ferrari or whatever and, and actually worked for them. Except he worked out that if he's a Christian, it's very hard to live the Christian life traveling around Europe with the team. And so he decided, for the sake of Jesus, to give up that whole desire. Where is your heart? The challenge to full-time ministry is not for all of us. But when we do hear the challenge, why not? It takes away that idol, doesn't it? That idol of our career, of our safe and secure job. What is it that we actually live for? My Sunday school teacher, when I was seven and came to Australia, she kept on, only taught me for one year, they kept on sending me Christmas cards, birthday cards for the next 20 years. She's an old lady now. She has a son who had Down syndrome. They were not rich at all. And yet God looked after them. Uh, my parents were uh, her dentist and, you know, gave her sort of free treatment and they were not rich at all. When my mother died last year, I was ringing around all the different friends of hers and I rang this lady up and she remembered me. And she said, oh, I really would like to go to the funeral, but I got this, you know, I'm, I'm living in the nursing home. I really would like to come, but I'm sorry I can't. I said, don't worry, don't worry, it's okay. And she sent a bouquet of flowers and with it a check for $200, which is a lot of money for her. I, of course, just didn't cash the check. See, there's someone who is not living for this life, but sees that there's a lot more things that are valuable and in front of her. Heaven itself. We got to actually listen to what Jesus says. I'm not going to give you pre prescribed response. Very easy for some churches, you know. You know, guru leader and says, look, this is what you're to do if you follow Jesus, right? You've got to come to church X many hours a, a week and do evangelism. If you haven't evangelized someone today, or well, are you sure you're a Christian? Um, all these rules and regulations that come. And who makes up those rules and prescription? It's the church run by the leader. No, no, listen to Jesus. Listen to what he says and be challenged by that. And trusts your father. So we finish with Matthew 6, verse 31 and 32. Not only 
are we those who seek first his kingdom? Not only are we challenged that what we, what we drink, well, that's what the pagans run after. But look at the end of verse 32. And your heavenly father knows that you need them all. He's the father, the God of all history, who's come and bring the blessings of the kingdom of heaven. He's the father who, to whom we pray, our father in heaven. And he's the father who's the God of this creation who feeds the birds. You can trust him. And so the challenge comes, verse 30. If God so clothes the grass of the field that is here today and gone tomorrow, will we not clothe you? O oh, you, O oh, me, of little faith. What do we trust in? What do we depend on? Now, this friend, th th this passage is not talking about people who have mental health and where they're deep anxieties, where they do need medication and professional counselling. In our messy world of, of childhood trauma and bullying and abuse and all other things, there are deep insecurities. We need to seek help for those things. But even in the messiness of all that, we still need to be pointed to our good Heavenly Father. He knows, He cares, He's in control. Proper counseling that's biblical is going to point us to Jesus and our Father in heaven. That is the real change that is not self-seeking, but seeking God's kingdom first. Deep down, who do we ultimately live for? Who do we ultimately trust? I'll give you a couple of minutes to talk to your neighbour about this question. What would it mean for you to seek first the kingdom of God? Introduce yourself to them. Two or three minutes just to chat about that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think if it's particularly playing on Sunday, that's not an I don't think that's an issue. I uh, I think we can take our day off, you know, once a week, any day of the week, right? It doesn't have to be the Sunday. Um but yeah, in terms of there's nothing wrong with being the top of your field necessarily in itself, but ultimately that's not the thing that's going to draw people to Jesus. Uh, Kaka actually, um, as my friend Josh Chin tells me, actually in the end got divorced and married a, a younger supermodel and um, yeah. Right, so it's how you live your life in the end that's going to draw people to Jesus, not where you are in your field. Some of us uh, can get to the top just because we're gifted for that field, right? Some of us, in order to get that HD, we just got to spend all our week and, you know, all 10 weeks of session just studying and do nothing else. Seven days a week, you know, 20 hours a day just to get the HD. Well, if it's, if it's a must, you've got to get the HD then it's starting to become a god, isn't it? Perhaps one more question? Yes.
Yep, great question. So if we're called to seek first the kingdom of God, why is it that not all of us should go into full-time Christian ministry? Because you think that you know, telling people the Bible is how people enter the kingdom of God. And you think, you think, oh, that's seeking first the kingdom of God. Seeking first the kingdom of God is wider than just ministry full-time. It's actually wider than telling the gospel. Seeking first the kingdom of God is seeking that in all my life, Jesus will be the king, will reign. Not just, you know, some bits of my life, you know, when I go evangelizing or it's all my life. It's all my decisions. And so to limit it to evangelism or to limit it to um, doing full-time ministry, that's reducing what it involves to seek the kingdom of God, to put Jesus first. Moreover, not everybody should do it full-time. Um, if everyone does it full-time, who's going to be paying for them? But it's worth being challenged. Why not? And if there's some good reasons, why not? Right? It could be because you are a mother and you got to look after your children. And that is your full-time ministry. It's great, isn't it? Your husband goes out to work and pays you so that you can do full-time ministry to your children, so that they can grow up to know Jesus. That's, that's great. Another reason is why not do full-time ministries? You might not be able to explain to people, you know, very clearly what, you know, you can only, you know, do one-to-one -one or, you know, sometimes people just, just can't put a sentence together. There, there's some reasons why it's not a good wisdom for you to do full-time ministry. And sometimes I have very uh, difficult conversations with people who who want to do full-time ministry. But I've got to say to them, look, actually, you can actually serve God's kingdom better in other ways. Right? That by your living a godly life, that's how you serve the kingdom. By your support of gospel ministry financially, and that's how you serve God's kingdom. But what frustrates me is sometimes you have some people who have all the gifts, are very able, and really should do full-time ministry. But what holds them back is their parents and what their parents want for them, and it's actually what they want for themselves, that is to live for this world. Last question, Tian. Hmm. So, uh, thinking in this way, you would not uh, enslave your wealth to weigh the words that the world wants you to do. It's just your thoughts and, and your actions that carry the effects of the world. Hmm, good point, right? That even you would to pray for the, you know, the Christian world class, whatever, right? Soccer player, you know, badminton player. You got to pray for them that they won't be, it's so easy to be tempted, isn't it? to go into the world, just like we can be tempted. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask that we would so live for Jesus to know that he's the one who's brought in your rule into this world. Thank you for his death. Thank you for his resurrection. Thank you for the forgiveness that he has brought. We ask that we might live for him and we pray, Father, in, in little decisions and big decisions, we might weigh up what it is to seek your kingdom first. And help us, Father, not to be seeking what we wear, what we can own, not to look for those things for our satisfaction, for our security. And we pray these things. For Jesus' sake.